ISD 535, where the live stream video may be found. The agenda and documents for this meeting are available at our, on our board doc site at rochesterschools.org backslash board docs. Present at this meeting are school board members, Superintendent Kent Pakel, a non-voting ex officio member, and Assistant School Board Clerk, Ms. Lori Sam. Ms. Sam, would you call the roll? Director Barlow. Here. Director Cook. Here. Frederick Mark Garcia. Here. <laughs> Sorry. Clerk from Boston. Here. Director Marvin. Here. Chair Nathan. Here. Vice Chair Workman. Here. At this time, we offer the opportunity to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item 2.01, approval of the agenda. Are there any changes to the agenda? Move approval. Second. It has been moved and seconded to approve the agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The agenda has been approved. Just a note to everyone here and watching, if we are still meeting at 6.30, we'll be taking a 10 minute recess around that time. We'll try to be finished with the second item on the agenda, 3.02. So it might be a little longer. Our goal is to try to get through 3.02 before we recess. So our first focus topic for the night is the long-term facilities maintenance plan item 3.01 this is an information item superintendent Fickell. thank you chair nathan and board members and speaking of people who might be watching our chief academic officer dr Ogbamu, was not feeling well today and so i encouraged her to head home she had taken a COVID test but she is watching and so wanted folks to know that i also believe board members most of you have had a chance to meet andy crockstead who's our director of finance who has joined John Carlson's team as John has assumed his role of Chief Administrative Officer. Officer. So Andy, good to have you here. Just want people to know that we have some important expertise on the subjects before you tonight in the room. Um, this meeting in some ways is the John Carlson Show, uh, in partly because we are rescheduling a um, previously scheduled topic for when John was a bit under the weather, the weather our long-term facilities maintenance plan. Um, so we're playing catch up with that and then we are going to be turning to some important budget issues. I obviously want to thank John and Andy for their leadership, but also as we'll talk about both on the facility side and on the budget side, uh, the presentations before you today are the result of many, many people and really careful thinking and we have a superbly managed and led district in these regards. So we're going to begin with the update on our long-term facilities maintenance. The one issue that you will not see before you um, tonight in this update is uh, the question of the middle school pools. And as I've talked about with a number of you, I am bringing some fresh eyes to that question. There was a previous presumption of covering them up um, for some different reasons. And I am taking a look and in dialogue with both principals and physical education teachers and community members about that. And so you don't have a recommendation here, but we will certainly bring that to you in the coming months as we um, frankly look at both the financial and educational and extracurricular benefits of those pools. And other than that, everything else uh, I think is here and I will turn it over to John to give you an update. Oh, very good. Thank you, Superintendent Chair Nathan for this opportunity to talk tonight about our long-term facilities uh, maintenance plan. Um, specifically, we're going to just walk through a variety of issues related to that plan, but I've also, since I've had the opportunity to uh, turn this into a study session, just throw on some additional things that aren't technically long-term facility maintenance revenue um, items, but just want to share with you some of the ideas and situations we're grappling with right now. So, um, but first off, I thought I would just give some primer and some background on what we have now. Um, by the way, for all of tonight, I did not do any extensive PowerPoint, so everything that I'm speaking from is in board docs. I've got um, attachment A up from the very first item here that I was just going to um, briefly talk about, but I'll just be kind of working them through. I'll try to get them up on the screen. I hope the connection stays stable for that. Um, so we have 34 owned buildings now that we have the four brand new schools completed. 
uh, we have now 3,430,943 square feet of space that's in our name. So we either own that or we're leasing to own that space. Um, additionally, we have 10 buildings, and those are at the bottom of the um, listing there, where we are renting space not to own, or we are getting the space complimentary, free of charge from a partner um, entity. So all total, if we were to say how many buildings does Rochester Public Schools operate in, there's 44 different addresses where we do business today. Switching then to the actual long-term facilities maintenance plan, I'm not going to go through this line by line, but just the, a refresher. This has all of our buildings and all of the projected larger maintenance projects that um, are deferred on a schedule over time uh, for the next 10 years. I think it goes out through FY32, which is like the 2031-2032 school year. So. Um, it's kind of an interesting read to kind of see all of the different projects that are in queue over time. And I need to say too that this list sometimes is affectionately referred to as the 10 minute plan in, in our facilities, not to be trite or to say that we don't follow the plan, but sometimes things just break, sometimes things leak, sometimes things fall apart faster than they're supposed to, and we have to shift and shuffle and move uh, priorities around within the dollars that we have. So. Um, just know that this is the plan as of July 26, 2022, but I can guarantee you after we're done talking tonight, it's going to be different uh, than what we have here. Um, as far as funding goes on the long-term facility maintenance plan, just to kind of give um, people some background on that, about one-fourth of all of these projects are funded on an annual pay-as-you-go levy, meaning the school board sets the levy each fall at a number that we put on uh, up to MDE and ask them to put on the levy sheet. And the other three-fourths is funded by issuing bonds over time. And so what we're trying to do is keep our taxes relatively flat as a percentage uh, of taxation. So it is increasing as the property values within the district are increasing, but we're trying to keep the impact or what it feels like um, relatively flat over time. We certainly could change our strategy. We are one of those districts, we're formerly an alternative facilities district, which means <laughs> in law, we have more flexibility than the other school districts that have to live within a per pupil amount of long-term facility maintenance revenue. We basically can set the amount that we think is appropriate for our district. So if we felt this plan does not meet our needs, we could ask for more or we could ask for less um, to be on our plan. Um, and this is the number that, that we've been guided to with our financial advisor, Ellers, to keep taxes, like I said, approximately flat over time. Um, as of right now, we have funds from the 2020 and the 2022 bond issuance. They're sitting in their building construction fund. Those are generally reserved for finishing up the John Marshall IAQ project. That's a three summer project. And can I ask yeah. IAQ is? Indoor air quality. Thank, Thank you, you for that. So I try not to abbreviate too much and I just did. So indoor air quality at John Marshall and then up at Kellogg Middle School, um, right behind that. Um, the school board does control of the plan in the sense that when we bring bond issuances to you, you have the opportunity to say no at that time or to not authorize us to go and, and borrow the money as well as the annual pay as you go levy. So the school board is in control of how much revenue is available uh, for us to spend. And then annually you need to approve the 10 year plan. So recently we did a facilities assessment on both Kellogg Middle School and Edison Administration Building. Those are the next two buildings that were identified in the plan over the last few years that need major renovations um, or indoor air quality projects. And when we do indoor air quality projects, we're not literally just doing the heating and the air conditioning because oftentimes we have to go in and destroy ceiling tiles. That means taking down lighting. So while we're doing all that, we will fix lighting, we will fix ceilings, we will repaint the walls that get damaged. Um, lately, we've been fixing plumbing fixtures, we've been redoing floors, but being as long as we're in there doing a major overhaul, we might as well just get those projects done rather than scheduling them out on a different summer. So here's the bad news and what came forward. Um, 
We have about $31 million identified in the current 10-year plan for Kellogg and Edison building. So $31 million. If you read attachments, uh, I think C and D in the LTFM, you would, and you kind of just ran down to the end where the budget summary was provided, you'd see that the architects and the engineers that did this facility assessment said to, to get Edison up to where it needs to be is about $8.5 million and Kellogg is a little over 40 million. In fact, that number is growing. It grew uh, again this week because they realized asbestos abatement in that building is gonna be way more significant than they thought. Uh, so they said plan for another million and a half dollars or so uh, to address asbestos abatement. That's for this building? That is oh. for Kellogg. Kellogg. Okay. Kellogg. So you. Kellogg is more like a $42 million project as it sits right now, Edison eight and a half. So we're sitting here looking at $50 million of potential work to be done and about $31 million sitting aside in the 10-year plan. So that leaves us with an obvious problem of what do we do next. So with a lot of thoughtful discussion internally with staff and um, our architects and engineers, uh, I asked the superintendent that we recommend uh, that we don't do anything at this time to Edison, that, we've, that we put all of the money that was set aside for Edison and Kellogg and Fridell coming in 2028, 2029, because I think the future of Fridell is still uncertain what we want to do with that building long time, and take all of the money from those three projects and put it towards the Kellogg project and do a major um, you know, indoor air quality renovation, upgrade project, whatever you want to call it, uh, to keep that building functioning for the next 50 to 60 years, I hope. While we are there, we would plan to also, if we have funding, deal with some of the other things to bring Kellogg a little bit closer to uh, the news middle school, Dakota, and address things like the auditorium, technology, and any other security enhancements that we would need. So we'd try to um, upgrade on that as funding were available from non-LTFM funding sources. So before I move forward, what questions would the school board maybe have so far on that? Part of the recommendation we're not asking for any vote here but what we are trying to figure out is what do you feel about the kellogg situation because what we would do barring any major uh, blowback is we would bring forward actually the construction contracts or the architects contracts at the next school board meeting under consent and, and get them going on designing that because if we're going to do the project in 24 and 25 they really should be designing right now to get ready for that. John, I, in as much as Kellogg has students in it, and Edison for the most part does not, it's, it's, you know, it's for adults, mm -hmm. and in as much as Kellogg has an asbestos issue, mm -hmm. um, I'm very comfortable with moving those funds from here to there. Okay. I would like to point out the asbestos issue is all behind walls right. and ceilings right now, so there is no immediate risk to anyone. So long as nobody is in there and taking apart the pipes and looking on them, they will not get <laughs> is that, asbestos. Is, is that similar problems. to what it was at Mayo High School a number of years ago? Yeah, all of, all, of our, all, all of our schools probably had asbestos if they were built between, before 1965 or 70 or whenever that, that changed. So. John, I have a question. Mm -hmm. yeah possible addition of the technology auditorium and security you mentioned getting you know maybe on par with Dakota how does that compare to the other the John Adams and the yep so th that would be taking it up probably a step above John Adams and Willow Creek and then so that obviously raises questions what are we going to do long term with those um, and so I think as staff we are fully aware that that would create probably a unequal situation and we would try to remedy that at some point too is that something you'd add to the plan then? It would not, because of it's not a long-term facility maintenance revenue funded project, it would probably be on a separate plan not showing on this, so. You. Can you briefly explain what is on long-term facility yeah, maintenance revenue? thank you for that question. Long-term facility maintenance is to deal with things that are degrading or deteriorating over time. It's not to just make upgrades that are nicer than what you have, so if, components of the auditorium were failing and needed to be replaced, like the lights fell down and the seats came apart, like that would be LTFM. But just deciding we want new sound equipment when the current sound equipment works, it's just not as nice as what is standard for today. That's not LTFM. 
Dr. Mark. Yeah, thanks for this, John. Over the, over the years, there have been discussions, as you know, about possible different ways Edison could be used. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that putting that on hold for the time being really makes sense. But do you have any idea, and this may be impossible, with the rising costs of materials, um, if this is the estimate for doing what needs to be done to get Kellogg up to where it needs to be, in a year or two years, any idea how much more that's going to yeah, cost? so what they've done is they, they call it escalation, so they already are accounting for if they have to buy materials in the summer of 2025, so that should, barring anything really unusual, that should cover inflation to that point. Good. But if we were to kick the can down the road and wait three more years, four more years, yes, then we would expect the price to go higher. Thank you. Dr. Barber. Uh, I, I read through the recommendation and I didn't view all of the pictures, but I thought uh, that was a great add-on, not only for members of the board, for but for the public as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we can see what it is uh, that is being referenced and, and why the need exists. Um, I fully support the recommendation in terms of not that adults are dispensable, and no one is suggesting that, but um, the prioritization I think is important. And within the recommendation uh, or the presentation, there was a uh, that questionable what are you going to potentially do one day with Edison. So I think that discussion, I, I'm not sure it's a part of tonight, but uh, uh, I appreciate the fact that. Uh, it's at least in queue, and we'll have opportunity to discuss that at one time, uh, at some point rather. I did have a brief inquiry regarding attachment A as it relates to uh, lease space. Uh, any of those amounts, will they affect the um, budget that we're, uh, budget areas that we're looking at? Yeah, so um, we have not made any recommendations within one of our future items we're talking about later tonight to cut any of those budgets so we are fully planning to keep those spaces at oh, least for the next year. More so meant that from uh, the life of the current uh, leases, will they potentially impact uh, by increasing our... Uh, so you mean in cost, will right, they go right, right, up over... Right, yes, right. The, um, that could happen. and. Um, like the Career and Technical Center at Heinz is a long-term lease. It was locked in for like 15 plus years. So, you know, that one's just kind of inching up a little bit every year. But another one like um, J&J Properties where we store vehicles, um, that one's maybe one to two more years. And at that point, we need to renegotiate. So it depends what will happen at that point. Thank you. Dr. Carlson, um, the, I agree with Dr. Barlow. The Knutson reports are, were really interesting. And I think what I found about the Edison piece is reading through is that their conclusion is there's just time, right? It's Edison's time to, to be re to evaluate. There's nothing that is uh, out of, there are things that are out of code, but nothing that we would be cited for. The air, there's nothing about the air quality that's unsafe. It's just in the cycle, it was time to look at Edison and it's sort of, like we said, secondary to, to Kellogg. Is that a good that's a good way of summarizing it. We know that there are improvements that could be made. There are some things that are wearing down our, our floors and things like that. Our heating and cooling systems might not be the best shape that they could be in, but they're not an immediate end of life. Like we're struggling to maintain heat and air conditioning right now. So um, there's also the issue of secure entries here. And that's a, a topic we've been talking about. Well, we have our doors locked and you have to buzz in it still is slightly uncontrolled in where you can end up in this building once you get in. And so that's not typical of, of our um, school buildings where you do have to go through the office, you do have to meet a live person, um, and then you are taken to where you're needing to go at that point. So there are some improvements that we'd like to see, um, but I think it, we need a lot more discussion on what should the long-term plan be for administrative space. So I have a question about the security piece. Um, since the door is open to the public now, mm -hmm. that means anybody from off the street, off the parking lot, could come into the building and wander around and we would be unaware. That is correct. You mean during the court? Yes, like right now. That's right. 
we have our offices locked, uh, but there are still areas that you can get to where there might not be somebody and um, it's not an ideal situation the way it's set up right now. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, is there, uh, okay. is there um, do, um, what is our understanding of the the difference between the thirty one million that was or roughly thirty one million that was planned for air quality at Kellogg and Edison combined versus the the estimate that we're seeing that's quite a bit more than that? And yeah. does that make us wonder about some of the other projects that are further on down the line and yes yes and yes so a couple things are going on there one as you know significant inflation has incurred, <laughs> has occurred like we got dakota middle school bid and built at the exact right time that building was built for just under 60 million dollars they're telling me that already if we were to go and rebuild dakota today it's 70 million plus so it's gone up probably $10 million just in a couple of years' time. Um, so we're fighting that. The other issue is when we develop the 10-year plan, we don't always know exactly to what extent the project is going to be. So we put in some rough ideas, some rough estimates based on historical costs that might be six, seven, eight years old at that point. And we might have tried to inflate what we did at Bamber Valley, say in 2018, by 2%, 2%, 2%, but really it was going up 10%, 10%, 10%, and um, we're just off. And to your point, we are exactly what you're saying, fearful about the Mayo High School indoor air quality project that's coming right behind Kellogg. Um, that instead of 60 million or whatever price we have in there right now, could be $100 million by the time we get there. And so, we do need to continue to watch these and to figure out is is our long-term strategy to, to keep doing these projects or at what point do we decide to do something else? Like we did with uh, Bishop, for example. And you rebuild it. Anything else before Mr. Carlson moves on? Okay. Um, the next kind of area that we had wanted to talk about kind of switches off the long-term plan. This is where I get some bonus time since we're here. Uh, and we wanted to talk about um, referendum projects. As you know, we've uh, finished most everything. We're in the process of paying off the final bills from the construction that's happened to date. Um, but as I was roughing out the numbers the other day, we have about $3.7 million left in our building construction account that was from the 2019 referendum. And that's assuming we get all the bills paid and they come in at the, the amounts that we have encumbered right now. So we still have some things that have come forward as requests and some things that we could do uh, with those funds that are sitting there. Um, for example, these are some of the requests and some of the ideas that have come my way um, over the last uh, couple months. So add exterior fire alarm speakers at certain schools. Apparently there's issues with not being able to hear properly um, at some of our schools. Within the referendum, we had uh, said that we would consider buying additional land. We bought land for the Dakota Middle School where it sits, um, but we had said maybe we would buy another parcel for a future high school. So that is still in our minds, but not hasn't been an extremely high priority. So build or buy land for a fourth high school is something we could do. Improve security at all schools by upgrading and expanding the number of security cameras has been a very common request that's been coming through. Uh, improve security at certain schools by further enhancing the secured entry locking mechanism. So um, as we added secure entries as part of the referendum, we went to a slightly different standard where the office can now be locked in. So if there were somebody that we did not want to get out of the office, we could press a button and they would, basically you're locked into the office until help arrives. So at least you couldn't go further. You couldn't get out into the main part of the school. That's not how the secure entries were originally uh, built at some of our other schools. So there is a project underway um, to make that the standard in all of our buildings that have secure entries. Uh, increase security at schools by installing distributed antenna systems. As you probably remember in the last few months before Scott was uh, leaving, 
uh, you approved uh, distributed antenna systems at our brand new schools because as we realized as we moved in, the communication with issues that were happening because of the thick concrete walls that uh, that was chosen for the building materials is not allowing wireless signals to get through uh, very well. So we're putting in uh, distributed antenna systems to improve emergency responder radios. So like our police, our fire, our ambulance, um, our own internal uh, radios, as well as cell phones for the adults and students that are in the building. So that has been a known issue at some of our other buildings. I think Mayo High School is one of the most challenging buildings we have of existing buildings where cell phone signals are and wireless Wi-Fi access is just challenging in a lot of that building. Um, this, this next one is not a very fun one to talk about. Reslope the athletic field at Dakota Middle School. If you go up there and you put a ball at home plate and walk away, it would probably end up in the pond shortly thereafter. The field is sloping downhill. And I don't know who designed that or why that happened or how that happened, but it does not seem right. And there's already a request to regrade that field at a cost to us. I don't know the exact cost. Um, I don't deem that as a super high priority, um, but that is something that we could consider doing with some of our funds here. And then, of course, like we just talked about, upgrading the middle school auditorium so that Willow, J.A., Kellogg could kind of come up closer to what we are experiencing now at Dakota Middle School. Um, as staff and talking with superintendent, we would prioritize the following three things. We believe our, our best bang for the buck would be to prioritize secure entries, sec additional security cameras, and distributed antenna systems. So if we were to come to you and say, we've got this list, uh, we think it would be best to use on these three priorities and ignore a couple of the other things that I had mentioned in there to see how far we can get on the top three issues. And so we, without, again, taking a vote, we kind of wanted to test for reaction or see what kind of consensus there might be if we were to proceed with that recommendation for the remaining $3.7 million of our grant number. I think it's a sound um, rationale. I would support it. So if we needed uh, eventually to buy land for a fourth high school, where would we then get that money? The money could come from our general fund. It could come from our operating capital. Uh, but if we do use other money in the building construction account, to the fullest extent and it's down to zero, um, yes, we would have to look at a different funding source for it. Or a later referendum. Or a later referendum, yeah. At the time when we actually know what we need for another school and where we might need to place the school. We'd be, you know, that's been one challenge in my mind of like going and shopping for additional land is you know, kind of knowing where to put it. Mm -hmm. we, we all remember the Southwest fiasco. And so if we would have gone and bought additional land there, assuming that's where the next middle school or the next high school should go, um, that might have not worked out so well for us. So. Oh, Director Martin. Thank you. Um, I think the priorities that you have listed are exactly the right ones. And I know initially we were planning on buying more land for a future high school possibly. But I, it seems to me that w with the way education is changing, that we may very well in the next few years um, have a different vision of what high school looks like. And, um, and the building won't be as important as the programs. And the programs can be in a number of different places. So I, I know that the longer you wait to buy land, the more expensive it's going to get. But I, I think for the reasons that you said and for the way education may change, um, there are other things right now that are, I think are more important to invest in. Um, finally, I wanted to just bring to you a list of some of the struggles we that are coming up within the district. And this is not an exhaustive list of all the things that I have heard about or hear about as I continue to talk to staff and, um, and get around the district. But these are some of the issues that we believe would probably be best served to put together some sort of facilities task force. Again, uh, could be internal staff and some other stakeholders. 
um, so that we could develop a recommendation for the superintendent to ultimately bring to the school board for future decision making. But just wanted to get these things on your radar as to some of the things that have cropped up at this point. So a um, couple of the things that are hanging out there are, are setting for special education programs, specifically Phoenix Academy and the Rochester Academy for Independent Living. Both are located in the facility in facilities that were not designed for the unique needs of the special education programs that are going on. Um, I've started to feel in my gut, in my soul, so to speak, that I would like to see eventually some sort of appropriate building designed from the ground up, built for these programs, um, for these students um, versus trying to um, retrofit or put them into space that wasn't designed for them. So that is something that I feel we could look at. I also know that since they are special education programs, there are special law that we would not necessarily need to run a referendum for those. We could actually do what's called lease levy authority and the school board um, could decide to borrow the money on their own and build those facilities. That's something you can't do for a general education program, but for a special education program, you have that authority. Um, to make those decisions. So I would like to um, at least talk about that and continue to explore what would more appropriate space look like for them. We need to figure out what to do with our high school gymnastics gym. Uh, that was in a space that was not very good. It was lease space. We got out of that lease space. Uh, it's now at the Fredell building. Uh, depending on what we decide to do with the Fridell building long term, we'll determine then whether we have a gym there available for them or not. It's been hard to find a space. It would seem like you could probably just set it up and then take it down at night, but as, we're, as I've looked at it, that is not something that you can do. You need to set it up for the season and you need to leave it in place for the season. It's, um, it would not be safe or practical to take it all down at night and reset it up then the next day. So we need a dedicated gym for that somewhere within the system. The problem we keep running into is height of ceiling. There's been some ideas like, oh, well, maybe it could be in this gym at this middle school or something. And then you look at the ceiling like, you know, that's not going to work for this program. So it, it's going to require um, finding a different space. Um, consider consolidation of administrative and support departments that have been separated over the years due to space constraints. So our academics departments, our community partnership, our equity engagement, even our finance, our purchasing, our research and assessment, school support, technology, we've all been spread out depending on what space has been available at what time. And so we're not all in one administrative type of building for lack of a better word for the non-school type of uh, departments and positions. Um, decide on office space for certain district-wide special ed positions. So um, one of the challenging things we have right now is our ECSE teachers who have been officed at a Hoover Early Learning Center. We've dispersed them um, to Overland and Bishop recently to unused uh, or available classrooms there. I understand that they don't need a ton of office space because most of their job in the birth to three early childhood special education is actually going to homes and meeting with students in their homes. Um, but they do need some office space to do some paperwork when they're not at the homes. And so uh, we've moved them out of the Hoover Early Learning School. Um, our RPS online school staff, well, a lot of our staff are working from their homes. They're online teachers, online staff. Uh, we do have some of them that do require office space or do prefer office space, and they've had the fortunate ability to be in the Overland Elementary School for right now. Um, should that school continue to build out or grow out in the, in the numbers there, we would have to displace them at some point too. Um, something that has come around many times is having a professional development um, center that we can collaborate, that we could do not just for leadership of principals, but bringing in teachers and community members and just doing those kind of bigger group events. We've had a tough time locating the spaces around the district. And oftentimes we find ourselves going and renting space at a bigger facility uh, to accommodate when we want to bring people. And so this is something actually we could collaborate with other entities locally if we uh, could find such partners that would be interested. Um, install turf fields at Century and JM. I 
was able to rewatch the board meeting that I was out of town for last week and heard that discussion. So it sounds like that was already put out before you by uh, Mr. Queasley last week. Uh, locate better garage and warehouse space, preferably in the northwest quadrant. Um, where we have the van stored in a warehouse right now at night actually is a very good location because it's rather central to the uh, district. So when the van drivers depart in the morning, uh, they're kind of equidistant to, depending on which corner of the town they have to go to to get kids. Um, same thing is true with our facilities maintenance vehicles. We have some stored in sheds at uh, John Marshall, but it would be more preferable if we could have a second um, facilities uh, warehouse that we could store a few more of our um, graders and snow plows and lot mowers and stuff. Uh, if you think of going from facility services center in the far southeast and you need to go mow the lawn at Dakota Middle School, that's quite the hike with a lawnmower. That's too big to put on a trailer, but not fast enough to go 72 miles an hour down the freeway either. So it takes a while to get out there. Uh, we need to deal with Fredell and figure out what the long-term plan is. There's, I know, a lot of interest in that area of redevelopment. We've been approached at times to... Um, to sell, although we have not got a compelling offer um, that would make it a slam dunk deal. So we would need to uh, figure that out further. This building, as we just talked about, we're obviously not going to put the money into renovating, remodeling it right now, um, but we do need to decide what to do. You know, this is not a perfect building for office space. It, you know, I tell people I work in a kindergarten classroom because I think that's where my, <laughs> what will used to be at that end of the hall. Um, you know, it's, it's a school building and it doesn't have the m more modern collaborative type of working office space that um, would be preferred by a lot of our employees uh, these days. And then we should decide what to do with the Education Services Center. If we were to find a new home for Phoenix Academy, that would make that building available for something else or for resale. So. Good. These are just, that's the tip of the iceberg of some of the things that have come up. There are uh, probably a few more floating around in my mind that I did not put down on this list, but I think it's just telling that it's time to probably put together a group to talk this all out and uh, bring forward a recommendation to our superintendent uh, to give you an ultimate recommendation. And I don't know what kind of um, authorization you feel you need from the board for that committee but it is already established in our community advisory committees and liaison organizations policy mm -hmm. so I think um, in line with what we've done with the community budget advisory committee I think all we would need is an updated charge statement sure. and if, if you wanted to start implementing that I think we could call that the first step to making it happen I don't think I don't think we need our, I think our ultimate goal with all of our committees was to eventually put the charge statements in our procedures so that they were documented. Um, but that's something we can approve in one meeting. Great. Um, Any other comments on the list? Uh, Director Cook? Does the lease levy authority that you mentioned in connection with the uh, potential special education specific mm -hmm. um, buildings allow for land purchase as well? Yes, I believe you can do a land purchase with that. Okay, thanks. What's interesting is you cannot do administrative space unless you can prove that you need to, let's see, that you would alternatively lease space because you are out of administrative space. I don't know of a district yet that has successfully used that portion of law to say that they need to do this and have gotten it approved. There might be a district that tried it or did it, but I'm not aware right now. So there, it is a huge challenge to think about what would we do if we were to build a new administrative? Do you take that to a vote? Do you uh, borrow the money and use some of our general fund to make the loan payments? That would be an acceptable way to handle it as well. So we'd have to, to do a lot of thoughtful discussion on that before we'd have any sort of a recommendation. McLaughlin. I was sort of surprised with this list of things that a uh, work group might look at that it did not include um, the lawn fellow building in the potential extra space you know if we can shift the online school there or something like that I don't know how much is available and you know what that would look like but uh, do we have conversations? I think when I room? said there's a couple more things floating around in my mind there's a couple things specifically like that that um, 
are in here. <laughs> and, we, and we know that we're going to be talking about them in other contexts as well. So. Well, and it's a, it's a great point, Dr. McLaughlin. We have an active working group on Longfellow right now that is looking at bringing recommendations. Their first charge is to look at K-8 and the merits uh, and challenges of that. But they also are um, empowered to raise other options that might be there. As I think you know, there's a lot of enthusiasm in that school community for that option. Um, I certainly would be considering other options and ultimately bringing a recommendation to you. That's actually something that I hope we can make some decisions on this year, whereas I think it's unlikely we'll be making these decisions this year. I think we need to get the committee underway and it's probably a next school year endeavor for some of these decisions, but I'm hoping to bring you some recommendations on long furlough this year. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. We've received some questions recently also about um, re-upgrading and refurbishing playgrounds. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that in the long-term um, facilities maintenance plan, the items in there about playground surface. Yes. Is that a possible topic for this committee to look at to see how we can have a consistent procedure funding stream for those yes. playground pro projects? Yes. Uh, that was a, that's a good reminder for me because the superintendent had mentioned that to me yesterday, and um, I knew there was something else to talk about. <laughs> um, but I was I was thinking about writing up kind of the strategy of how we fund them right now. It's 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 like a four to five legged stool of um, putting together different buckets of money to make uh, playground renovations happen. So, um, I'd be glad to um, to provide that to you at some point here, and then obviously the committee could, could be working on that as well. I did have one follow-up question. Um, there's mention of the gymnastics gym at Friedel now. Mm -hmm. Is that meeting its needs there in terms of the ceiling height and what um, they need, or is that going to be something that they may need something different? Ceiling height is adequate there. I think there are some difficulties in sharing with the day students, you know, having enough space and, and the work it requires to move equipment um, on a daily basis so that students who are there using the building during the day can have adequate gym space. So they're, they're working together as much as they can. It's a little extra work than they had when they were at Gage East. They didn't have to move, for, uh, move things. We've worked out other things like um, uh, loading equipment for an away um, meet and loading actual students away from the building uh, so that we're not having buses competing with um, vans and things with students coming and going. They're, they're working very closely together to work out the kinks. I think, you know, when we were deciding that or to put it there, it conceptually was a great idea. It kind of found a new space for rail and right fit and put the gym over there. But then when you unravel the day to day of how you run a school and then you've got this gymnastic stuff set right there in kind of the middle of their area, it has led to some unintended consequences of other things that we've had to. Yeah, the chalk yeah. dust can be a little dust, bit of yeah. a, an issue, but we've come up with a solution where kids don't eat in the gymnasium slash cafeteria, but they have an alternative space. So there's been a lot of um, give and take, so we can use the facilities to the fullest extent. Thank you. So as Mr. Carlson said, we're not looking for a vote tonight, um, but if there's any more input that you'd like to give, this is your chance. And I'll also turn it around and make sure that you've gotten everything that you think you need from the board to move forward with yeah, I feel these helpful. issues. It's sometime, I think, for me anyway, it would be helpful to see how this um, ties into our overall strategic plan in terms of the priorities that we're setting and, and all of that. Okay. Anything else? I think I have what we need that you can watch. I'm not hearing any objections to proceeding with uh, doing an indoor air quality project at Telog Middle School. So we will uh, gather an architect and engineering and a construction management uh, contract together and put those forward as resolutions in the February 7th meeting. Great. All right. Mr. Carlson, you are not done because item 3.02, five-year general fund financial forecast is the next item on the agenda. This is also an information item. Superintendent Pickup. I, I would like to share a few thoughts before the next item, but Chair Nathan, I will just go straight to John. Well, very good. 
So this is our updated forecast. Uh, it includes finalized data now from the 21-22 school year, as well as the revised budget that uh, you approved recently that um, takes all of our adjustments through October 31st, 2022. Um, attachment A is probably the, um, the document I wanted to focus on uh, to start here. And just I wanted to highlight a few uh, things. I call this the administration's commentary, but really what it is is it's all the background, all the assumptions that we made as staff in preparing this forecast uh, to get it to where it is. So um, whenever you're forecasting, you have to take some level of actual information, then you have to apply a whole lot of estimates under here. So um, just know that things can change and will change and things like the governor's proposed budget already would change um, some of the structure of this forecast if it were to be approved as presented. But uh, what we had at the time and what we have prepared this um, is as follows. We um, ha today have a revenue budget of $252 million in the general fund and $256 million of expenditure. I should say that was the original budget we started this school year. We were planning to draw $4.3 million from the um, fund balance. It was built on 17,157 paid student average daily memberships. I explained in the background that an average daily membership is the portion of students um, enrolled each day. So if you're here from the first day to the last day, you are 1.0 ADM for uh, revenue purposes. If you're here for, you missed a couple days at the front end of the year, you're probably a 0.99. And so it's just prorated down. Uh, we are paid based on enrolled students, not based on students who are here. So if there's a student who's missing because of illness or whatever, we don't get docked. Um, or if we have a snow day, we don't lose funding. We're, we're paid based on the enrollment and the proportion uh, compared to the whole year calendar. Our staff uh, budget was 2,654 uh, full-time equivalent positions at the start of the year. Uh, where are we at? Where we're at right now, the current revised budget is $259 million of revenue, $272 million of expense. Um, as I explained, within that expenditure budget is all the carryover from last year. So there's a, a chunk of $8.5 million there um, uh, of carryover money. And then uh, there are also new grants that was received from the time we approved the budget to, to now. Um, as I noted there, we have 2,676 FTE in the budget and filled as of the date when I pulled this was 2,562. So if you compare that to last year where we ended the school year, we've increased our um, percentage of filled jobs by about 1%. Our estimate for next year then is $263 million of revenue and $277 million of expense if we make no changes. In other words, that means if we just carry forward everything that we have today, and uh, apply some inflation to it, uh, we would be spending $277.5 million. We're basing the revenue for next year on 16,953 students, uh, paid students, and that would be, as you can tell, slightly lower than where we're at today. That jives with um, the uh, enrollment projection that we gave last spring. And for purposes of holding this flat and saying everything is in the budget that's in the budget, we are assuming 2,676 FTE. I will roll down and I'm going to then just stop here quickly on the revenue and show you a little further what we're expecting. So before the governor announced his proposal to increase funding 4% next year and then 2% the year after that, I had assumed 3% and 3%. So we would get to the same place over the biennium. Um, I just had it ordered slightly different than what the governor has proposed. So we will see how that sorts itself out. But in total, it looks like we'll be possibly at the same amount in FY25. Um, the big thing to note there is our federal COVID money uh, runs out next year. We will have that fully spent and exhausted by the end of next year. So we've got about $7.4 million left and that's included in the forecast, and then that comes out of the forecast in 25 and 26. Um, 
this is where it got really challenging really fast is to try to figure out what to consider for expense assumptions with given the amount of inflation and it's always difficult for me to put this out in print because I don't want it to be what employees start automatically assuming or start getting mad about because they would like a higher raise percentage or they don't feel that it's enough. I also don't want to commit the district to more than what we can afford based on what we think we know. Um, but for the purposes of this forecast, we are assuming a 5% salary adjustment next year and 4% the year after that. And I think I tried to clearly write in this document that no employee should read this and assume that this is the school board strategy for negotiating employment contracts. There are no open contracts. There's no open negotiations. We will come to the school board. Uh, we will seek a parameter from you upon which to negotiate. But for the purposes of trying to build a roadmap of, of, of forecast, we had to assume something because it's not logical to assume 0% raises going forward. So our best guess is 5% and 4%. Uh, for purchase services, uh, we use 3%. For utilities, we were a little more aggressive on that because we've been seeing um, jumps in natural gas and electricity. So we're using 7% and 6%. School bus, we know that we have one more year under contract with first student at a 3.5% increase. So that was a pretty safe number. We have to renegotiate with them. So I'm assuming five and five on that uh, for the next couple of years after that. And then hoping that it moderates down to three. Supplies, we're assuming three, 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 and three. Debt service, again, we know what that is because we have borrowed the money, we have the payment schedule, so we don't need to apply inflation, we just look at the schedule. And then any other miscellaneous accounts, we're assuming a 3% increase. As I stated, this is very challenging because in the olden days, we would have probably just assumed everything's gonna go up about two, maybe 3%. We just apply that forward and it's pretty accurate. Um, it's just hard to tell where we're gonna go long term here with uh, inflation. I'm going to skip down to, we're going to be talking about this a couple times tonight, but here's, here's the gist of what's been going on at Rochester Public Schools over the last decade. If you use FY12 as the basis, and I use FY12 as the basis because that's the first year we implemented our Skyward system, so it's the easiest to get data back to for for practical purposes, and it's a decade ago, so it's a good starting point. I don't know that we need to go back to the 1800s and compare what we had to then, but if we compare the last decade, our number of staff full-time equivalents has gone up 26.8% um, from where we were, while our student count has gone up 7.3% over the same time. So we've, in other words, we've been adding staff at a faster rate than we've been growing students. Our main driver of revenue is growth in students and our main driver of expense is growth in staff. And so when we talk about why does the forecast seem to get unbalanced or out of balance, um, part of it is because of the level of staff compared to the level of students. Now there's a lot of nuance in here because there's a lot of positions that come with funding from federal programs, from grants, from other sources. So there is logic in, in adding those but looking at this, there is quite a discrepancy in, and I think we've mentioned this before, but one of our peer districts, theirs was off just a couple percentage points and they were trying to figure out how to rectify that and get that so that the staff growth matched the student growth. I mean, they were not 20 some percent apart. And I think the important part to remember is this, this would have gone up to 30% is what our projection was for this current school year had we not made some reductions last year as we headed into this current school year. So it was on pace to go to 30.7, I believe. Uh, but we were able to bend the curve in the right direction, and that's actually helping our forecast here a little bit as we go forward. And then finally, from this commentary, I just wanted to share the fund balance, the unassigned fund balance. And as you know that you recently approved a change in policy, instead of having a 6% minimum, you've increased it to eight. Um, you would see that we would have historically in the blue met it in all years except I think that was the 2016-2017 school year. So we've been kind of writing the ship since then and trying to be uh, more thoughtful and more careful um, in, in, in our budgeting. And so we've actually been adding surplus uh, for the last five years in a row and our current fund balance is 13.1%. We are projected to end this year at about 11 0.1%. That's the black line there. 
The difference between the red and the black is the red is just showing the last forecast I gave you showed um, the fund balance going down further. The black line is this forecast, so things have slightly improved from where we were the last time we talked about forecast. So maybe let's stop there and just say, was there any questions anyone had in any of the background information, how we built the forecast before it put the graph up of the actual forecast? Go ahead. Go right. forward. All right. So we put it all together um, and we try to simplify it, make it just down to one page for easy viewing. Uh, <laughs> so as much as this is easy viewing, uh, what it's reflecting in column one is the current year budget. So again, 259 million in revenue, 272 million of expense, $13 million spending out of the fund balance there. Uh, we would end the year with 11.1% fund balance in the very bottom left there. Put in next year's uh, budget assumptions, the 263 and the 277 shows a $14 million gap. Uh, we would draw down the unassigned fund balance to about 7.6% of the expenditures next year. It would grow, the deficit would grow to $28 million the next year, again, because of the assumptions we're making with the revenue or the number of kids, students going down just a little bit our costs going up at a little higher clip than they normally have, um, and then the federal COVID money going away that year. And then if you just kind of follow that out, you go to the 2027 column, that's the year that if we were not successful in, in renewing the current operating referendum we have, that's the year that goes away. And so you see, if we just let the budget go on autopilot for the next four years, we'd be sitting at a $62 million deficit. Obviously, we would not let that happen because well, we would have already been taken over by the state two years prior to that, but <laughs> um, that would be a terrible situation where we would have very, very painful uh, budget reductions. Forecasts, you know, because again, they're built on so many assumptions, they're best in the short term. They help guide you to the long term to kind of point out things that are coming, um, but it does not, um, it's not highly, highly accurate in the four or five year range out. It's most accurate in the first one to two years. And then attachment C that I provided was showing um, what we're gonna be talking about at the next item. And so I don't wanna steal all the thunder of what's going to be in that item, but this just incorporates that uh, level of budget reduction and just trying to show what that means. And so if we were to follow through on the item that's upcoming, uh, we would be reducing our deficit almost to a perfectly balanced budget. It's only off by a couple hundred thousand dollars there. And so basically that's a balanced budget for one year, but you can see it already starts then in 2025, once the COVID money gets pulled back out, we keep the expenses in there, but we assume the revenue goes away and we're sitting at a $13 million deficit. And so that just is telling me, we either need to reduce some of the things that we're buying with our COVID funding, or we need to, uh, to look for new revenue sources, whether it be through the additions of state aid that might be coming our way um, or an operating referendum where we seek out the funding uh, from our local taxpayers that way. Dr. Mark. Um, you talked about um, average daily membership in the student version of the Yeah. Um, and I know that we, we're aware of the birth rate in Rochester and Olmsted counties as a way of projecting to the future. Is there any way that we have, and by we I mean you, have of um, estimating how many families with children are going to move in? I mean, it seems like there's building everywhere, but I don't know that demographics of people, of age of people who are going to be living there. I mean, is there any way of forecasting yeah, we that? We have not, we should take that back. So if we were to go back to the enrollment study that we did in the spring with uh, cooperative strategies, there would be some commentary on that and some level of assumption of birth rates and pop, uh, population change um, based on ages of housing and things like that and what's typical um, as a community ages. But that was not a rosy positive outlook there either. I think what we always miss here is what is going to happen in our local economy? What will our local employers do to expand, to grow, to attract new jobs, new families, new whatever? 
and that we just we don't have a specific assumption for that so if things were to go better in the economy and in our local employment situation i would fully expect that our student counts would rise Dr. Workman. um going back to our 20 is it 28 percent more staff than students yeah or the um, it had grown at 28% compared to students in about seven. Yep. Okay. So I'm, I'm thinking that, I mean, everybody's, well, not everybody, but a lot of people are just really excited about what the governor might do. But the way I look at this is any money that we um, got from the state of Minnesota should not be in uh, applied to deferred structural balance. I mean, I think we're going to have to do all of that regardless of what happens with the state because we are really out of line. I mean, smaller school districts or other school districts where it's just a little bit, they're going to have a lot more, maybe more leeway with, with how they, they use their, their funds. But I think to use the governor's funds to fill a hole, you know, what happens when there aren't any more funds? The hole's just going to keep getting bigger. So. Um, I think you're setting I, up your superintendent to uh, <laughs> properly give you a recommendation on the next one. I think he's going to talk exactly I'm about it. Sorry, that. I didn't mean to steal <laughs> no, your thunder, your, Kent. You're running it. I agree. That's well stated. Mm -hmm. Oh, Dr. McLaughlin. Um, John, I just have one question since I have you here. Um, going back to the graph that um, Dr. Berkman just talked about with the 28% um, and the 7.3%. Since I wasn't on the board back then, the 16 to 17 year, it seemed like that was the biggest jump. Was there anything unique about that time frame that caused that increase from the 16 to the 23 without the type of same increase in yeah, students? Yeah, my memory, I'd have to verify by looking at the data, but I believe that was the year where instructional coaching was expanded. It was the first year of the last referendum that we passed, so the first year the funds applied, and so I think there was some hiring and some expansion of staff. Was there time. thought then that there'd be more students at that time? Is that it? I'm not sure that it was necessarily built on ex expecting a lot more students, but it was using the resources to expand some of the positions that were available to support our staff in the district and our students in the district. Just very brief point. The projection that we're giving you for next year of the modest but more significant decline in enrollment than we gave last year is conservative. I'm a believer in being conservative when it comes to. I, I also think we're going to get increasingly good at enrollment projections. I mean, the issue Dr. Marvin raised just a moment ago is really existential for us because birth rates are projected to be flat. When you look back at the, and this is not Rochester's public schools specific, when you look back at the origin of the Destination Medical Center, the presumption was for many more kids with school-aged children moving into Rochester. That's not happening. Now we've had a pandemic and many other issues. Um, and so we have to keep watching this. And so the recommendation, I actually think we're gonna come out better than that. We actually, I think, I think our enrollment is gonna be above what we're recommending that you budget for, not wildly above, but we've done better uh, in the last year than some predictions suggested. But I think we should be conservative. I don't know what assumptions were made at the time of the increase that you're raising. But I think it's our job to always be conservative in that projection of our revenue stream. And then I will be thrilled to come to you and say, our enrollment's higher than we projected. And therefore, we are uh, looking better than we thought we were at this point. Attorney, can I have to follow up on that? That I was looking back a little bit at the projections from the spring. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that surprised me from that document, and I guess my question is, do you also look at the smaller bedroom communities around us and what are, are those having more families with kids in thinking about it as a Rochester resident that, you know, Rochester might not be affordable for younger families now so that they're choosing the bedroom communities, the Byrons, the Pine Islands, the Orinocos. Um, because housing prices might be cheaper out there or they can get more house for their money than they can in the city is that something you look at compared to you know yeah. the smaller communities with what yeah we we haven't put a lot of attention into examining around us but their projection last year did have a, an outflow ratio because it was a regional projection so they were 
projecting a certain number of families are going to move to community X. Um, but how, was it based on really rigorous trend analysis? I, I, I don't think so. They had a methodology that they applied, and so they expected a certain percentage. Um, it wasn't an exodus, but there was some presumption. We, we send more students out than we bring in right now. I think we're all committed to change that mm -hmm. so that we would actually have the influx coming in our direction in terms of not necessarily open enrollment, but families moving. Um, but that's a lot of factors besides the school district that influence that decision. Of and I guess my point is more to look at people who are coming out from outside the region for whatever reason, coming and working in Rochester because of our economic benefits, but not living in Rochester. Great point. That's a really good point for us to, to, to watch. Thank you. I think one thing you said, Mr. Carlson, about what our action options are based on what these numbers um, are telling us. So when I look at uh, fiscal year 24, with no spending reductions, we do not meet our policy requirement of having an 8% reserve. That's right. So the only option that are in our control right now is either to reduce spending or receive more revenue from the state. There is no referendum option. There's no other additional local revenue that we would get for, for, fiscal, for next fiscal year. That's right. And then as I look forward to fiscal year 25, we're in the same position um, with no spending reductions this year. Um, and the, the fund balance gets worse. Um, and our options for fiscal year 25 is that we could get additional revenue, and that could come from the state, but we could also have a referendum to provide that revenue. That's right. Or additional spending reductions or some combination of the two. That's right on. Nathan, I'm sorry, I have one more question. Sure. Um, since we're talking about what the governor has proposed, do his proposals for things like um, the changes to special education and the English learning make a difference here? They would make a big difference in here. We have not factored in that yet. Can so you talk I, a little bit about how yeah. that would impact? So we've, we've assumed, um, obviously, on the state aid, we're just slightly a percentage point off on the year that it happens, but in the total, we get to the same spot. So I feel confident our state aid is going to be pretty accurate for general ed. On the special ed, I think this, the proposal contained um, cutting the cross subsidy by about 50%. Well, our cross subsidy is well over $15 million, between 15 and $17 million. So that, that would be another seven to $8 million of revenue that's not included in the forecast. Um, Do you know if that's a one-time thing or is it are they planning on i should know this i'm on the legislative committee right but i don't what well, just came out today so we'll okay okay thank you yeah yeah but I, I didn't get to examine it either that um, one you know. time is it okay it's a one time so once again it's one time so it's not something that we can count on i mean it's nice for the one time if it were to be one time yes you, you but we still need to continue to do all of this other work my, I should say, my understanding, talking to people, I have not re read the final version today, my understanding is one time, well, obviously, it just came out today, we'll be looking at that very closely. There is a proposal that's in there, though, to shift building inflation into the general fund, right. which is a great idea that would help us strategically beyond the next two years. But it's a very important point for us to be very carefully watching what happens at the Capitol over the next five months. Yeah which we wouldn't know a final decision until May. Usually that's when it happens. So there's speculation there could be some earlier decisions finally this year, but even that is, there's still a lot of negotiation that has to happen to get to that. So possibly we'll know before we have to approve the budget. Possibly. Before our June date, but July 1st is our date. Even deadline. if they got it done on the very last day of session, we will already have prepared our budget for you. It would have been in board docs and you would have read it twice by that point so uh, <laughs> we're still going to have to proceed on some assumptions that we don't know everything yet so. any other questions or comments on this director Workman. i would just like to emphasize the um, point that dr Bickell made about taking a very conservative approach um you know not counting our chickens maybe ever yeah yeah that's that's definitely my philosophy. I know that that sometimes doesn't isn't the most popular way of looking at it because it paints a less rosy picture than it could be. But I think it's safer to do it that way. So we had said we were going to have a um, recess at six uh, thirty, and we're actually ahead of schedule. 
still a good time to take a recess and then we'll come back and do the next item okay. all right this board is recessed at 6 11 p.m when do we come 10 back? minutes all right
Thank you. Oh. Oh. This board meeting is back in session at 6.21 p.m. Um, the next item on the agenda is 303 budget parameters 2023 and 24. Board members, a reminder that tonight's discussion is intended to provide information for our deliberations and vote on February 7th on these budget parameters. And the direction that we provide through our vote on the 7th, along with the issues and concerns that we bring up tonight, will influence the staff meetings that um, Mr. Carlson talked about that will be happening in each building and department, and that will refine the budget that eventually we will be able to review, as Mr. Carlson said, twice before we vote on it in June. Superintendent Raquel. Thank you, Chair Nathan. Director Workman already made uh, very succinctly one of the main points I was going to amplify, which is that it is my recommendation that despite the prospect of potential increases in state funding, this board not turn back from the strategy you put the district on last year to achieve structural balance. Um, and that will continue to be my recommendation. And I believe it's the direction you gave me last year. And I recommend we stay the course while still being responsive to and utilizing those funds on behalf of our students. So. Um, that was point number one. The second point I wanted to make was really just about process. It's often said that budgets are about priorities, and that's true. The reduction plan before you now, I think, reflects priorities, even though all of the decisions are hard, in what it does not seek to cut. In particular, um, you will notice that, as we talked about at the last regular meeting, Dr. Garcia and others raised the importance of counselors, mental health professionals, social workers. You will note that that is largely absent from these cuts. It is impossible to entirely leave any part of our school district absent from these cuts, but we've tried to reflect the direction this board has given me and our strategic plan in what we are either not cutting or cutting less. It's critical, I think, that we all keep in mind that we are on the cusp next year of designing a budget and a funding system that reflects our values and priorities through investments. That in the strategic plan next year, we will redesign how we fund and staff our schools for implementation the following year. So this is the next to last year in our current system. And I will just tell the board this morning, John and I in the cabinet took a look at just one funding stream from the state of Minnesota um, that it's not even relevant exactly which funding stream it was um, here in RPS. And it was supporting good work, but it was not strategic and not aligned and not connected to the strategic plan. The board has already voted seven to zero to change that. And so we are on a path to fundamentally rethinking how we utilize our resources. Next year will be the year of doing that design work. You will, of course, vote on that new formula strategy. But I think it's critical to keep that in mind that we are in the last, next to last year of funding and staffing our schools in the current model. I think we have an enhanced process this year for a number of reasons compared to last year. We have had significantly increased involvement in developing this recommendation from our building level administrators who are charged with, of course, leading our schools. They were full participants in the working group that made a recommendation to me, which I mostly accepted and now is before you. And then we also had a much more robust process this year of taking back out to our building leaders, all of our building leaders, the request for impact statements on what the implications would be of these reductions. And so that's an enhancement, I think, from last year when, candidly, it was mostly decision-making that occurred within um, this building. So before I turn it over to John, a couple of important points of process. We are asking you, as Chair Nathan just said, to give us our marching orders, our parameters. We have kept this recommendation, or we've tried to keep this recommendation specific enough for you to know what would be impacted, but general enough that nobody sees their job in this recommendation. We know that ultimately this is about people's jobs, and that is why it is so painful and so difficult. But it is um, a dance to give you enough specificity that you can say, yes, 
head in this direction without giving uh, too much specificity such that in a public meeting we would be handling things of, of, of real sensitivity. Another reason not to do that is because we're going to learn some stuff in the staffing meetings that John and his team and Jackie and others are going to have with our leaders when they take your directions and break it down building by building. And as board members will recall, and I, I know Director Cook, you paid attention to this last year, some of the things changed between my recommendation and your parameters in February and what I ultimately recommended to you in June because we learned some things. There were some things that I removed from the recommended reductions. There were a couple smaller things we added. So we're asking for the big picture now and things will change between now and uh, the time in the, in the spring when we ask for the final vote. Um, the last process point I would make, and it's one that I'm actually making a little more for myself and for the uh, administrative team than for board members. Discussions like the one we've had earlier tonight and the one we're about to have are invaluable to us as we hear what you're thinking. There were a number of times last year though when one of you made a point that then became interpreted in our internal discussions as the will of the board. But it was one of you feeling passionate about an important issue, which you should, you're elected to do that. And one of the things that I think is part of my job is to say we need to be attentive to that. It's it's a, one of our leaders giving us direction, but ultimately it's the full board that will be voting. And so I want us to hear what you're saying tonight and in the comments you'll be sharing um, as invaluable uh, feedback from you as our governing body, but ultimately you act, as you all know, in, in the collective. And so we'll be listening carefully, but uh, realizing that ultimately it's where you all vote in the spring that's gonna determine where this recommendation ends up. So. With that, ask John to do this. Um, the recommendation uh, is, is one that I am making um, as opposed to the working group or, or John or others, but it was deeply informed by the ideas that I got from them and I'm really grateful for a lot of hard work that went into this. Very good, thank you. Um, so I wanted to just talk briefly at how did we get to this point and why are we cutting the budget again when we cut the budget last year. So first off, this is not a surprise to us. Um, we put together a three-year roadmap for you last uh, year and it had budget reductions for the current school year in and has budget reductions for the next school year in next school year or the one that we're talking about here. Beyond that, it has either more reductions or passage of a referendum or some large increase in state aid to kind of, as Director Nathan pointed out, to make it all come together and be back to a structurally balanced budget. So again, we're following the roadmap. This is year two of a three-year plan. We also predicted this um, in 2015 when we did the last referendum. I remember explicitly saying many, many times, we are asking for an amount of money at that referendum that would get us through the 2019-2020 school year without significant budget reductions. We made it a couple years further. We made it through the 21-22 school year without significant reductions. It was first when we had to do significant reductions, the 22-23. So the way I look at it is we made good on our promise and added three years to that through trying to carefully manage at the end uh, specifically managing our contract settlements to stay within an amount that we believe we could afford. But there's some other issues that have been out there too that have been um, plaguing us. The general education aid formula, which we've talked about, is set by the state legislature. In 2002, they took large control over how education in Minnesota would be funded and said, we are in charge and we will increase the, the rate when appropriate. Um, Many charts have been made over the years that if it had just simply kept up with CPI, it would be much higher rate than it is right now. In fact, for Rochester Public Schools, we estimate we'd be sitting here with $17.5 million more in our revenue budget than we have. So when you think about doing a $14 million reduction, um, we probably wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation because we'd be $17.5 million ahead. That would wash out what we're already, um, or what we're trying to do here. We also have the special education and the English learner issues that have been uh, in front of us for a number of years as well, where both the federal government and the state government have not uh, held up their uh, standard of funding. The cross subsidy, as I mentioned before, for special ed or the amount of money that we take out of general education and apply to a state mandated 
or a federally mandated service like special education is a little over $15 million in our district. So you add those two issues up, the general ed and the special ed, we're up to $32.5 million more of revenue we'd have um, to support the expenses that we uh, currently have. And then the English learner cross subsidy, although much smaller, um, is still a significant dollar amount at $3 million a year. So in total, there's like $35 million there that we believe we are entitled to or should have been entitled to if um, other units of government had kept the promises that they had made to public education. So we find ourselves here trying to do the difficult work um, that we didn't sign up to do, but it is before us and it's a problem we're gonna solve at this time. Um, so what did we do to get to this point? Um, several things have happened in the last year, one of them being settling all of our labor contracts. Um, that was a significant deal for us in that um, we came to the board and we asked you for a parameter adjustment for our hourly workers specifically because um, we quickly realized that trying to give a 2% raise to somebody that makes $15 an hour, so offering them a 30 cent per hour raise in this tech environment was just not acceptable. We didn't feel good about that. There was no way our union groups were going to accept that um, either. So we came to you, asked for a higher parameter. You said yes, and with the understanding that we come back and we adjust the budget uh, appropriately to be able to afford those additional hourly increases. So. Next year, in our forecasts and our formulas, we're assuming that nobody makes less than $19 per hour um, at the district. That's what our new minimum wage here is at Rochester Public Schools next year. And so the level of cuts that we are uh, recommending or the superintendent is recommending is um, higher than what it was on our roadmap last year, but it's to account for these additions in um, hourly wages that um, we incur. As the superintendent said, we had a budget reduction committee that met many times from September to December, so we got right after it uh, um, during Labor Day week, and we met many times to, to figure out what we would um, bring forward to the superintendent for his consideration. Uh, we had several cabinet members, and we had a principal from each um, building level, and I would, I would concur with what um, Kent said, that it went much better. We had a lot broader and better um, engagement this year in this process. Separately, we also asked all leaders within our organization to do a 5% budget reduction process. We said, every leader, everyone who spends money, go through your budget and tell us how you would cut 5% from your budget, because this is about the approximate percentage we needed to cut um, for this recommendation. We took those back and we did not accept every recommendation. We looked for themes, we looked for general ideas, and then the committee worked further to refine um, um, our recommendation to the superintendent as to what would be cut. I would say the other important thing that was different this year is we had a lot of consensus and a lot of agreement in our working group. And so um, it was a very positive process, even as painful as it is to go through and look for ways to um, uh, come up with less positions here in our budget. Um, I wanted to mention too, this this process would have been better informed had we had the Community Budget Advisory Committee up and running at this point. Um, we are still in the process of uh, figuring out um, exactly who we're inviting and when we're having our first kickoff meeting. What we've done so far though, you know, even as of this week, is we have planned out a couple of the agendas of what we're going to do once we get that group assembled. And I'm still crossing my fingers and hoping that we will have the committee ready um, to look at the proposed budget after we do some um, education sessions with them, but we would be looking at the budget for the 23-24 to at least get a reaction um, to see um, if they would have any thoughts or further ideas. Um, for us so that we can kind of use that in our recommendation to you um, for the 23-24 budget. Um, again, that's kind of contingent on pulling everybody together, but we're still hopeful that that can happen here over the next couple months. So um, be watching for that to get up and running here. So what is our roadmap for next year? It's kind of summarized in the memo that the superintendent um, um, gave here. So I will quickly just get to that up on the screen. So $14 million of budget reductions. $7.4 million of federal COVID funding, 
$200,000 would be the deficit, though we would pull that from our fund balance or our savings account. And then we would continue with delaying a couple different transfers to our OPEB health insurance, our GASB unused sick time severance account. Um, those don't have an impact on anyone receiving current benefits. It just means we're saving a little bit less for the future, hoping to make that up at some point in the future. Um, so I think it would then be appropriate, unless there's any questions on those broad strategies, to get into um, some of the specifics of the reductions that superintendent is recommending. Seeing none, um, I want to reiterate that we've, we've tried to do this in a way that nobody could look at this and, and hopefully can't identify their specific position because that's a painful process to have to sit down with people in the coming weeks and tell them that their job is ending at the school district on June 30th. And so this is a little bit broad, broader than it was last year because we, we learned that lesson that as soon as we put something out in writing, it is going to circulate. It already did on Friday, a few hours after it had been posted in board docs and we got some feedback. Um, but we're trying to be sensitive so that we can have the conversations that we need to have after we get your direction, um, hopefully in a couple weeks here. Um, I also wanted to re, uh, say that while you don't see the cabinet listed here as a specific reduction, uh, the cabinet has been reduced uh, a third over the last year since superintendent has been here. So we feel like we were uh, on the cutting edge of reductions and leading uh, by example and taking some of the painful um, cuts at the start of the process. Um, and so that's why you don't see specific cuts to the cabinet in here. But other than that, uh, we have most every other group uh, represented here with some level of reduction. Um, and so that's how I presented it. I put it by work group. And so the first one there is administrator positions. Uh, we have recommended that one administrator be cut uh, and that we would shift and restructure uh, leadership and supervision duties. And so that represents 9% of that work unit. This, and these go alphabetical. They're not by priority or anything. So don't uh, read into that or assume that. It's just it's purely alphabetical. Administrator, next up, clerical. So in our clerical group, uh, we have identified two positions that uh, would be sunset at the end of the school year. And that represents 1.9% of that work group. We would take work that is left over and we would try to find ways to prioritize it. Some of it might not be done again in the future and some of it would have to go to other people. Um, in other positions. Reduce education support professional positions. So we had a lot of conversation about this in our budget reduction uh, committee and well, uh, we value all of our education support professionals um, and this will be most acutely felt in the supervision of students before school, after school and during lunch times. Though we do believe there is going to be opportunity for our principals to buy back some of these positions with compensatory aid um, that they will be allocated um, during the budget process. So, well, this is a cut primarily either to the special education formula or to the general ed formula. We do think the compensatory formula will be able to make up some of these positions, although I don't think it's going to be able to make up all of the positions. So we have recommended 8% of that work unit or 42.6 full-time equivalent positions. Maintenance positions. Um, so uh, we are recommending nine maintenance positions be reduced. Uh, that would be 6% of this work unit. Uh, where this will be felt is in our classrooms uh, because we will continue to prioritize bathrooms, common areas like lunchrooms, um, drinking fountains, all those kind of high touch areas are going to be prioritized and get daily cleaning. And then our classrooms are going to have to be on a rotation basis. Um, that may already be happening due to staffing shortages. So um, fortunately or unfortunately, people may or may not notice that. Um, but that would be the primary impact people are going to see. Um, Director Cook had placed a question in our Google Doc ahead of time, like, do you foresee like this kind of just being redu reducing vacant positions? And in some cases, that's exactly what's going to happen. I know that there are multiple openings within our maintenance group and our custodian group specifically within maintenance. And so some of these reductions are on paper. 
we are taking away a position that's in the budget so we can use the dollars elsewhere. A, a, a human being would not necessarily be losing their job in all of these situations. It's helpful um, also just to get a sense of how many of these changes would be actually reflected as changes that impact students relative to the status quo. Um, yeah, thanks. Quick question. Yeah. So, for example, um, on the reduction of the education support professional positions, does that reduction of 42 percent or 42.6 for, per, percent or FTE is that actual real human beings or is that the on some of any unfilled? It's positions? a little bit of both. There's okay. going to be some positions lost that are filled and some that are vacant. Okay. John, since you're talking about that topic, um, when you talk about the compensatory state aid potentially improving, the, can you estimate for us how how many of the 42? Yeah, so the, the total increase in our compensatory state aid for next year is approximately $2 million, $2.5 million. So that's the amount of additional revenue we're going to get above what we get this year. And I mean, as you can see, if we proceed with 42.6 less ESPs, that's estimated at $2 million. So theoretically, if principals used all their dollars to buy back ESPs only, yes, we could save probably the majority of those positions. Yeah. But I do know that some principals are going to prioritize maybe some other teaching positions. So it's going to we're going to let our principals have choice. Now. Thank you. That's really helpful. Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah. Um, I had memorably uh, multiple experiences last year, in particular, as we're going through this, of education support professionals in particular saying to me, please do not consider the elimination of an open position an easy cut. Because it's a position that we really want filled. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was at Century High School and someone made that point with a lot of passion. Somebody who had been short-staffed in a classroom at a point. And so while I appreciate the point about it's not someone there, it's a cut. I mean, it's a cut in a very real sense because we wouldn't have the position if we didn't need it. Yeah. The other piece, I do see the possibility that an increase in compensatory, uh, which is intended to be dollars to support students living in poverty, might be used to replace some of these positions. I don't, however, think we should set the expectation that it is a, an immediate conclusion because those dollars should be providing educational services to kids living in poverty. And so it's not a job security funding mm -hmm. stream. So I would be expecting our principals to be thinking very hard about whether that position is serving our most vulnerable students. Um, I am positive that I will be recommending dramatic changes in how we use our compensatory revenue in this district to this board a year from now to much more tightly follow our highest needs students. We're not there yet, so I think it's a, it's a reasonable prediction, but I would be giving the guidance to our principals that as you make that decision, it's the needs of the kids first before preserving the positions. We have a lot of great people that are difficult that are being impacted by these cuts and so in many cases they might make that choice but um, I wouldn't want people to assume that an increase in compensatory means these cuts are not on the table also in some of our schools that have fewer students on free and reduced price lunch they'll see far less of that compensatory revenue and will therefore not have that tool to use in in dealing with these reductions Thanks. Yeah. Um, next category, line number five, reduce non-schedule positions. Actually, non-schedule and off-schedule are getting new names. Very soon we'll be releasing different names for those groups. I don't know if we're ready to share those quite yet. No, it's, it's going to be the big reveal. <laughs> Jordan is going to have the greatest tweet ever. <laughs> yeah, I just have hated since I've been here calling someone non-schedule and off-schedule, and I just can't stand it anymore. So they have come up with good names. One of which is even an acronym that makes a word. So. <laughs> That's some serious thinking. It is. I like it. So, yeah. So, yes, in the future, we'll be ref referring to these groups differently, but for now, they are still the non schedule group. Non schedule in our lens means um, health office nurses and mental health practitioners, and is that it? That's it for right now. Those are the two job types in that group. And so we are recommending uh, a slight reduction, 2.6 FTE, and I think these are health office nurses and changing the staffing pattern and the staffing ratio of health office nurses in our buildings. Uh, reduce off-schedule positions, 5.6% of that group. 
This is a group that we affectionately say is not a hodgepodge, but it's a group of kind of everything else. If you're not in a clerical unit, you're not in the principal unit, you're not in another group, you're left over in the off schedule. Uh, group. <laughs> Oh, that sounds terrible. I mean, <laughs> see what a yep. Now I'm really <laughs> digging it here. Okay. Anyway, it's a it's a collective group of people that don't so fall well. into a unit. That's a highly qualified, say. very valued people. <laughs> yes. Please don't. Can we just delete the case? <laughs> Two minutes ago to now. Nine point six FTE is recommended to be uh, cut here. And uh, again, that work would be prioritized, redistributed. Some of it might not continue going forward. Teaching positions. Again, you, in an in a organization where the majority of employees are teachers, it's, and it's what we are here to primarily do is to teach children. Uh, but we can't achieve budget, uh, re significant budget reductions without having some teacher positions uh, reduced, unfortunately. So 5.2% of this work group. Um, there's a variety of different ways we would get there from increased class sizes at elementary, middle school, high school, perhaps some less electives being offered at the middle school and high school. Um, significant adjustments to the formula for special education teacher to student ratios. Uh, there'd be a reduction in instructional coach positions and we are eliminating the graduate induction program. And so all total 76.8 FTE of teacher positions. How much discretion do we have to adjust the formula for determining special education teacher to student ratios? Is that something that's completely in our control or do we have certain parameters set by the state? Do you know? Discount. Who would like to answer that question on our staff here? I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad to, but do you want to talk about maintenance of effort? And then there, there is not a mandated state ratio, so we have flexibility in that. We need to make sure that we're not reducing services to the point where we can't guarantee that we're maintaining our aggregate effort, which John could probably describe, no, qu unquestionably could describe better than I can. Yeah, maintenance of effort means that if you spent $1 million this year serving 100 kids, um, you need to spend an, uh, an equivalent amount the next year, but it can be adjusted if you've got less kids or more kids. It could go up or down a little bit, but you, the point is you need to keep spending kind of at that same ratio uh, per student. And so I think there's a variety of strategies um, that, that need to be looked at here, and I think are being looked at here, and it comes down to um, coaches, case facilitators, teachers, ESPs, and kind of how the system that we have built and kind of rethinking um, how it is built going forward. Okay. And John, is that a statute or a education rule or where does that concept come Maintenance from? of effort. Mm -hmm. um, it's taught to us as if it's a finance rule, but um, <laughs> yeah, I think it comes down federal. from the federal government. Awesome. And the federal government just supplies so much money to us for special right. education. Right. That was a start. promised 40 percent but i don't think it's ever gone higher than about 14 percent or so maybe 17 or 18. Yeah. dr martin um john under increasing potentially uh, increasing elementary class size targets by one that's clear what's the increasing the middle school formula divisor by one or two for middle school and high school yeah I don't know what that once means. we get to middle school and high school it's not these little sections where the kids follow the teacher for the whole day and so it, it we use a different formula for that and we say we take the number of kids in the building and we divide by a number it's the divisor and so basically we're making it a higher divisor which means there'd be less FTE allocated so they're gonna have to tighten up the schedules and, and maybe increase this class size and I bit. should know this but is does the contract have a cap for there is there is a cap. Um, it's 160. 160 students. So they still need to schedule based on that. And our middle school principal who was working on this committee says she can still get it scheduled even with the divisor going up by one. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Um, Number eight, increase activities and athletics admission fees. So this would be the amount of uh, uh, ticket charge, so to speak, if you're going to the hockey game or the football game as an adult or a, a student, uh, we're proposing raising the price by 20%. We haven't adjusted the fees in a, in a number of years, and so 
Um, if you think about inflation, 5%, 5%, we're kind of at that point where about 20% seemed like it would feel the same as it did four or five years ago. Same thing with the activities and athletic registration fees. So this is the fee you pay to sign up to play sports or be involved in the activity. Uh, number 10, reduce contracted services, supplies, and capital expenditure budgets by 5%. So this is a district-wide cut to all spending budgets. So this is not just our school buildings or it's not just the Edison staff who spend money. It's, it's all of it. Um, number 11, reduce contracted transportation. It looks like my screen disconnected um, by 5%. So we would um, shoot to um, reduce our spending on our contracted transportation by 5%. Separately, we're working on a study right now on how to potentially make our routes more efficient and how to um, do busing um, differently, which could be changing start times. It could be um, looking at three-tier busing. Um, so we're, we're doing that study. We really don't have any information quite yet to share on that and to give any recommendation. Um, this is more of a hope that we could get um, to a 5% reduction uh, through some combination of strategies that, that we get back. Reduce contracted technology services. We, um, in, in that area, rather than decreasing technology employees, we took the approach of could we shave off um, uh, from our licensing bill or our licensing soft, software licensing bills or our contracted technology. And so we chose that instead of a position. Reduced cooling usage is paired with re, uh, reduced heating usage, and that's just trying to adjust our thermostats by one degree in either direction to make it slightly cooler in the winter, slightly warmer in the summer, to try to sh save on some energy charges. And so that is how we came up with uh, $14 million of cumulative reductions. Board members? Right, John, I have some <coughs> clarifications. Um, we'll post the questions and answers that board members submitted like we usually do, but there were some that I think would be helpful for people watching or just for us all to be reminded of. If the class size targets were to be in, increased by one, what would they be? Uh, so the class size targets then would be, sorry, hold on. Kindergarten, uh, 21 students per class, up to 21. First grade, 25. Second, 30. Third grade, 30. Fourth, 32. And fifth, 32. Um, if you're looking at the commentary that I had written there that people will see later, it, <coughs> students don't come in perfect little groups of sections. And so when I did the analysis, um, I found that um, on average, the average section is about five under the target. Meaning even though kindergarten may be, that's a bad example, because I know we do run our kindergarten pretty close to 20, uh, second grade, even though it's 29, the average um, class size in second grade is not 29. There's a lot of sections that have 24, 25, 26. So in, in, what I'm trying to say is raising the class size target by one doesn't necessarily mean a hill of beans to a lot of people. It, would, it really depends on how many students are enrolled in that building in that year and how we have to divide them up that year. So for those classes that are close to the target, I, I think I remember in the past, we provided some adi additional support to the classroom. Are, are we maybe an additional ESP or? That is something that my colleagues, uh, Jackie and Carl, we talk about um, nearly weekly in the summer when we're approaching that. We're watching it very closely, like it's time to add another section, which means hire another teacher. Or in consultation with the principal sometimes like after a couple weeks three weeks four weeks into school year say it's not practical now to hire another teacher maybe we could hire an esp to assist that teacher and put them so there's two adults in the room to maybe balance out a class that has 32 second graders for example and when you go and do the staffing conversations will the numbers of the students be known they're known as good as they are. Our registrations change daily here. And so we take a data cut, you know, the week of staffing and say, 
we're going to staff you today based on what we know today. We're going to watch it every week through the summer and we will roll out. That's why we put contingency FTE in the budget. So if we get to that point where we need to, we will say it's time you get to hire another teacher. You get to divide that group of students up into one more section. So they'll know if they have classes that are approaching the target. That's even right. At, they're going to know in their staffing meeting, at least on the numbers that we have as of as of that meeting, they'll know where they're at. Kindergarten is a little harder to predict yeah. because uh, we don't have all the registrations usually until well into the summer. Yeah, that's more. Oh, Director Markham. Uh, yeah, I think your point about them not coming in neat little sections is really good mm -hmm. to remember because I remember a number of years ago one of our community members said, well, you know, you have 30, 30 fewer fourth graders across the district, you can cut a teacher. But it doesn't work like that because unless those 30 students are all in the same school, yeah. it, you know, so I'm just reiterating, reiterating what you said on that because I think it's important to remember. For fun, one day I had taken all the kids in the district and said, if we were all in one building and we could like have all of first grade in just one facility, yeah, you could save about 40 more positions if you could maximize, but because you're split into 17 different schools and you have to take what you have in that neighborhood and serve them, um, that's why some sections are running below the target. That's how finance directors have fun. That's how we have fun. <laughs> <laughs> It was an exercise in <laughs> trying to figure out no, you how much fun. more efficient could you be. Yeah, <laughs> can I just say, too, can I just say too, oh, um, sorry. The, to the point that most of our classes are, in the, like you used the 24 example with um, second grade, there are, we do have some classrooms. I don't want people to think we, everyone's sitting that comfortably. We have some classrooms that are getting right at that target. And we do look at that every single month because kids don't just come to us at the beginning of the year so when we get our February update we'll look at our hot spots we call them and if they're if if we do have someone that uh, a, a section that goes over or a grade level that goes over we generally will uh, work with the principal at this time of year it's usually ESP supported. I'm just trying to balance out that if you hear larger class sizes that does not mean that every class is overflowing it's right. meaning the target might go up yeah. and it might impact a school or two. Uh, so <clears throat> going back to the reduction in teacher positions, and I, and I understand the sensitivity to not wanting to drill down with sufficient specificity that you could identify individual people, but um, there's, there's four different categories here. The increasing the classroom size in the elementary, the divisor for the middle and secondary or the secondary schools adjustment to the special education formula and the elimination of the graduate induction program and instructional coaches i think is the first one. Yeah. oh okay yeah. are the are, are there kind of how are the these positions distributed across these programs are there a couple of them that are the significant drivers is it are you able to say anything more about that? Um, Let me jump in and say you will get that specificity before you vote on the budget, for sure. I, I want to let John answer the question, but that ultimately, yes, once we have had these staffing discussions and before we're asking you to vote, you will have that level of, you, that level of specificity because we will have gone through the staffing meetings, we'll be able to provide it to you, and people <clears> will have been informed. Um, in terms of right now, I don't know how on the, on the fly, you, well, you're able to uh, yes. answer that one. I had them all. Obviously, we knew all that detail. I mean, this was sure 300 plus lines of data that we rolled up into like 14 board items here. Um, off the top of my head, you know, I probably shouldn't even speculate just to get in trouble. So I'm not going to. But um, we Let's will have, like the superintendent saying, we would have that detail for you. Let's see what we can provide you with for the February board meeting mm -hmm. on that score. And if we can get some more, if I'm hearing you right, some, some more categorical breakdown within that. Because mm -hmm. um, we are going to ask you to vote on this larger strategy in February. And so let's see how much more specificity we could get you within that category. I would presume maybe the same might, you might be interested in the same for the ESP reductions, the, the education support for professional reductions as well. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how much more detail we can give you. Would that be helpful? Yeah, it would. I, it, you know, partly because the, um, 
for me, certainly I can get my head around what it means to increase a class size target in the elementary school. I, um, I think some of them are already too high. Um, but I don't have a great sense of especially the adjustment in the ratios that are driving special education staffing. I, I don't I, I don't even understand how, and I, some of the other directors' questions have, I think, gotten at, at this point. I don't even understand how we have that level of discretion because it seems to me that special education is driven entirely by the needs of individual students. Mm -hmm. And so we just have to provide the special education staff that are needed to meet those needs. I, I appreciate that that has to translate at some level into a budget forecast and being able to, um, you know, project what level of staffing we think we're going to need in the future in the absence of knowing the current level of needs for that year. But um, that one makes me a little nervous because I just don't even understand how we could do that with any confidence. My brief understanding, because we, this is not something that finance has worked on its own, this has been um, our special education. Dr. Abamu in academics with her special education directors have really pulled it apart and figured out what they need precisely. What you're saying is we have to cover what's written in the IEPs. We have to provide a certain number of minutes of service. But what we have also found is that we have a staff that has many additional positions beyond serving, directly serving kids through coaches and other positions. Well. Okay. That, that's part of it. Let me answer B and Dr. Obama is not here, but we, we are overstaffed in special education in key areas relative to best practice in the field. And we have, we have to look very carefully. That, that is one of the reasons why we are doing the, the audit or implementation review with the university. And we have fabulous staff. So this is a difficult and careful issue. But there, are, there is discretion in how you decide. You're absolutely right. We, we need to and we want to meet those student needs. There is discretion in exactly how you staff to meet those needs. Uh, in the big picture, this is a relatively modest adjustment in terms of the largest, larger size. This is going to be a very important discussion for the board to be having over the next several years as we navigate this. And so I, 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 I hear and appreciate the request for some level of greater specificity. Um, this is candidly new work for our district to bring a critical lens to this critical part of some of our most vulnerable students. And so we need to treat it with real compassion and uh, emphasizing a do no harm approach, but we also cannot get to budget stability if we don't take a look at our staffing and st special education. Um, so we'll, we'll see how much, how much greater clarity we can bring you by February, but I really appreciate the point that, that we need to have real dialogue about this not just as we make these cuts this year, but, but over the next several years. Could we wrap into that discussion, perhaps a comparison to other similar sized districts, how they do it? I, I, I can, I've actually asked, I've asked for that. It's not as easy to find as you, you, you might expect mathematically. And so I'm asking for the exact same thing. And so over time, yes, I don't know how much we'll be able to get by February. Mm -hmm. Um, just because it's not necessarily something every district shares easily accessible. Um, but yes, we absolutely need that. Or, or even ballparks or yep. ranges or something yep. like that I think would be helpful. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Director Barlow. Is it safe to say, though, uh, that um, student needs will continue to be met even though staff staffing ratios may change? Yes, in this recommendation, at this level of reduction, yes. Going forward, we really need to be vigilant on this because that's, we're all committed and I know this board wouldn't allow us not to meet those student needs. But in making this recommendation to you, that was actually the single, that was the single issue, this is the single issue on which I spent most of my time with Dr. Arbonne, um, that at this level of reduction, I am confident um, we can do that. Going forward, we need to really do some really hard thinking. Long term, the biggest issue is making sure we have a guaranteed and viable curriculum for all kids in that tier one. And so we're not over identifying any of our kids for special education services. That obviously is not a tool in our toolkit for this reduction, but like that's the big 
the big strategy that we need to be uh, putting in place for the next five years, for sure. So, Mr. Carlson, in the um, the high school formula um, adjustment, something that we talk about every budget year is the seventh choice option for students, and it's usually for band, orchestra, or choir. Will that affect any of those offerings? I think there's a commitment by our principals to continue to allow for the seventh choice for music electives. What might be impacted is some of the other elective classes. And in those cases, would we just see more students having study hall as opposed to an elective course? Could be. It could be just that we're increasing the class sizes a little bit of some of our other electives. Um, there was a question in here about um, like which courses would not run. Um, I think we have to take the perspective too of there have always been classes not run. Our principals have staffed based on the number of registrations and they don't run every class just because six students requested it. They're looking for classes that have 20 something plus students that have expressed an interest in it before committing staff to it. So, um, and I think that process would continue and then if, if they're unable to run every class, then that pushes those kids into one of their other choices that they've pre-registered. Dr. Workman. Um, Chair Nathan, I'm glad you brought up that question about music electives, something near and dear to my heart that I don't talk about very much, but I think people need to understand that, especially with the ratio of um, students to teacher for high school band, that person is actually buying staffing for the school because they are not limited to the 160 students per day. So if you have a high school band director who has 240 students, that's a 1.0 position. Um, and if you take the music departments as a whole, um, pre-COVID anyway, there has been you know fewer staffing for that number of students for that particular collective. Um, so when we talked about the broad strategies, broad strategies to a balanced budget, which is a catchy title, I think you gave, gave it, uh, that we approved in January of 2022, um, one of the approaches was to use the unassigned fund balance for fiscal year 24 and spend down the fund balance to 8.0% of expenditures, and that was $2.6 million. In this recommendation, we're using $200,000, and that will leave us with a 12 to 13% budget reserve. So can you address the rationale for that change in strategy, and also maybe a little bit more about why that reserve is so important for our monthly yeah. cash flow? Yeah, I think the strategy to get it as close to balance this year is, again, to kind of uh, hedge towards um, getting structurally balanced. Um, uh, as fast as we can. Um, the other part of your question there about what does fund balance do, and fund balance is our cash flow, so to speak, during the year. Not all of our payments come in at the exact time that we owe money, so having a little bit of reserve does help us time out and consistently meet payroll and pay all of our bills while we're waiting for uh, reimbursements from federal funds and, and so forth. Um, I appreciated when the board increased the policy from 6% to 8%. That's closer to a best practice of probably, um, you know, a double digit would probably be even more ideal, but 8% um, is a good number for a, a public school district with consistent funding. Um, having fund balance also allows us to weather the storm in tough times where we can intentionally say, you know what, we don't want to take all of this hit or all of this reduction in one year like we did for this school year. We can intentionally plan to spend some of it and kind of work our way through the system. Um, it also gives us those one-time purchases, like if we need a vehicle replacement, or if we need a construction project, or uh, we need to implement a new curriculum. Having some fund balance helps you do those one-time things and not have to significantly disrupt your ongoing allocation. And then one more, um, one of the uh, reductions in the teacher positions was the elimination of the graduate induction program. Um, everyone might not understand the history of how we got to that decision. So can you give a quick summary of how we got to that being in the recommendations? Um, 
let me do that and um, invite John or board members uh, to <coughs> comment on the financial aspect of that, which um, candidly, the way that the GIP or graduate induction program was funded was highly complex through a partnership with Winona State University. And it predates me by a few decades. And so there's, there's a savings for us in there that John can talk about if that's of interest. Um, the GIP program is about 38 years uh, uh, old and has uh, a proud history of having brought many, many talented teachers and educators into the school district, some of whom went on to be principals, many of whom are still here. It was reflective of the type of program that existed in many school districts around the country. And the basic guiding theory was giving a teacher a master's degree early in their career would benefit um, students and would benefit retention um, of those teachers. And so in Rochester, it has been, Carl, about 12 teachers a year in recent years, as few as... It used to be 16, and we, we went down to 12. Okay. And they're all elementary teachers and general education teachers on the whole, and they have most all that's been a partnership with Winona State. And um, it's been wonderful. It is not, however, focused on teachers who are in shortage areas, um, such as special education, English language learner programs, and it has not been focused on teachers who are from communities that are underrepresented in our school district at this time. It has also required every year Carl and the team to hold out 12 or in previous years 16 elementary teaching positions for um, GIP residents who we do not yet know who they are going to be. And that means we don't make job offers to 12 to 16 other people who come to job fairs. Um, and as we all know, the most talented uh, candidates often go quickest. And GIP came onto my radar screen last year when the previous dean of the college came to me proactively and said they're unilaterally ending it because they had decided it did not meet the university's strategic objectives. I requested a year extension. We redesigned the financial structure and I took a deeper look at it and concluded ultimately that when we get next year into the work of redesigning our supports for recruiting, retaining, um, and supporting our staff. We need to create new uh, programs like the Graduate Induction Program. And Winona, uh, I've already talked with the president, and I'm going to actually uh, be on their search committee for their new uh, associate dean of their Rochester programming. They're potentially a strong partner in that work, but we are going to take a pause next year and not have um, a program while we do that design work. And I'm sure we'll have multiple higher education partnerships in the future. Um, but they need to be targeted on areas that are shortage areas for our district, because otherwise we are putting precious resources into a type of teacher that is not hard for us to recruit uh, in this current job market. Does that? That was that was that was really great. Good. And it's tough because it's a wonderful program that has had a great legacy, and I've talked with our chair and vice chair about finding some time in the. Uh, the board calendar where we can uh, celebrate and recognize the program and thank our partners, even as it's a difficult decision to sunset it at this time. Any other questions, board members? Director Cook? Yeah, uh, just one more. Um, oh, famous last words. <laughs> I try not to say things like one more. Um, <clears throat> uh, the recommendation to increase fees for activities and athletics, I, I can't. I can't help but think about the last study session where we were focused on deeper learning and I think many of us came to the conclusion that um, that a significant portion of deeper learning opportunities come through extracurricular activities um, and opportunities for leadership development and all kinds of things and just helping students connect with their schools and identify their passions comes through these types of opportunities and while I'm reading the the rationale and the impact statement as sort of there's an implicit assumption that more students might avail themselves of scholarship opportunities or some kind of uh, financial aid, some proxy for free and reduced lunch if that goes away, if these fees were to be increased. But my concern is that actually the enrollment in these programs would decline. Um, and when I think about applying an equitable lens to the impact of some of the proposals here, I think that this one potentially has it, could have an outsized impact on exactly the community of students that we 
um, really want to give every opportunity to mm. pursue their passions. Um, and relative to the projected financial impact of $62,000, I, I think it warrants a very, very careful look. And I, and I understand that the proposal here is sort of for the top line number and that there will be shifts within that, but that that's one category that really jumps out at me. If, if, I, if you know, if, of course we don't live in a world where we have unlimited resources to allocate how we'd like, but if anything, I'd love to see fees go to zero and in really all of our extracurricular programming. I think it's incredibly important and I look forward to the work we're gonna do on deeper learning initiatives to tie some of those features into more aspects of the um, general education experience, but um, but that, that one does concern me. So. Anyone else? So do we have everything we need for preparing for our February 7th vote? I think so. This is invaluable guidance. We, of course, will send out a revised version with a resolution. And as, as before, you can ask questions in advance. Uh, I know you will, and we will we'll respond to those. Um, so you'll have another opportunity to flag issues before the, the meeting. Um, one thing that I've been thinking about when it comes to the question, and I'll talk to our chair and vice chair and our executive committee about that. Um, so I'll just say this briefly and invite board member feedback at a later time. The questions you ask that we then post in board docs uh, and that we respond to seem to me to be, it's an invaluable tool. I am inclined to keep our staff responses to you in that forum to be issues of information, clarification, response, explanation, not reaction to board member suggestions for change in a written format because it's an individual board member. So um, we've had a few, and you guys have good ideas. So sometimes you say, what if we did X? I think I'm inclined, and John and I were talking about that this morning, I'm inclined to say thank you for that feedback. We will incorporate it into our decision making as opposed to, well, the problem with that would be this, 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 and this. So that we're saving that analysis for study sessions and board meetings when you're here as a corporate board. But I'm enthused and I really want to thank Lori for coming up with a much better tech platform for us to be doing that, yes. those in. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And so we're starting to get some real traction with those written questions, but I think if we feel our charge in those questions is to provide you with information clarification you can still raise ideas but what we'll probably say is thank you we'll incorporate that into our decision making and then we could talk about it in a forum like this as opposed to providing you with reaction to your ideas that you're you're raising in those questions for future work i think you should still do that but our response will probably be message received thank you uh, but we'll talk about that in the executive committee and kind of try and standardize that a bit. Because I think, especially as we get into the difficult work ahead of us on this issue, on start times and other things, those questions are going to be a really important tool for you before you come to a board meeting. And we're trying to really organize our calendar around getting those responses in. We're going to keep getting better at that. Um, so it's kind of establishing that protocol, I think, is a good idea. All right, let's move on. 4.01, the updated ABCD, speaking of future meetings. Um, are there any items that a board member would like to add to the agenda for a future meeting? Hearing none, the upcoming board meetings are February 7th at 5.30, which is a regular meeting. February 21st, 5.30, a regular meeting. February 28th, 5 o'clock, a study session. And March 7th, 5.30, a regular meeting. And hearing no other business, this meeting is adjourned at 7.19 p.m.